Hi, everyone. This is the Coffee with a Geek show, and this is another Black Mirror support group episode. Uh, for those of you not familiar, Black Mirror is a television program produced in Britain, and it is uh, pretty dark and foreboding. A lot of its themes are about technology and kind of if we extended beyond technologies, uh, I guess, dangers to kind of extreme levels. And it's very similar, um, you know, in theme to say, um, what's that old show? Help me out, guys. The old uh, Rod Serling, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Yeah, so each episode kind of leaves you walking away most of the times in a pretty dark, depressed mood. <laughs> Occasionally there's some positive episodes out there, which we should talk about because we usually talk about the, the hard hitting ones. But so our session today, joining me today is Heather Krieger, a technology integrator at Williamsville Central Schools. Also is Matthew Mariglia from Starpoint Central, also a tech integrator and teacher. Uh, not here today is Jennifer Murphy. She had to do something else in the real world, which happens. And uh, I was gonna say, starting off, part of the problem with us setting up these Black Mirror support groups is we're busy people <laughs> and putting yeah. all our schedules together is almost impossible. So we thought we'd try and do one in the summertime where all of us could maybe have a little breathing room and even that is, is difficult and challenging. But so today's episode, we really wanted to talk about the episode which I found to me personally was one of the hardest hitting episodes and really left me kind of stunned for a long time and thinking even to this day about the impacts of what was going on in the episode. And I'm gonna turn it over to Matt here in a second to have him kind of review the episode. But um, this episode is called Metalhead. And if you're a 80s person, Metalhead was like a, you know, that cool guy down the street <laughs> that listened to hard rock music. But Metalhead in this particular case has a whole different context. Mm -hmm. So Matt, with that, maybe you could do us a favor and summarize this episode as best you can without re revealing too much. And feel free if you want to do a spoiler, just uh, give us a little heads up and uh, that way we can go from there. So Matt, take no it away. Problem, Andy, thanks. Um, been a little while since I've watched it. Um, but from what I recall, it, it kind of opens with three people, uh, two men and a, and a woman. And I'm, I'm really not good with the character names, remembering the character names. And they're driving in a car, heading somewhere. And, and from what limited dialogue you can um, get from them, they're, they're searching for something. They're going to get something. Um, and, and basically, this car um, ends up at a warehouse. Um, and really is, and I, I believe in the warehouse is when we're first introduced to uh, these, can I call them robot dogs? Is that the appropriate? Um, it's kind of like a, you know, yeah. post-apocalyptic world. Uh, it's completely in black and white, uh, filmed and shown in black and white. Um, and it's obvious that these three human beings are afraid of these dogs or don't want to have attract these dogs in some way. Um as they search in the warehouse, obviously uh, things go awry. Um, some things happen to a couple of them. I don't want to give too much away on what happens to the three characters. Uh, I guess spoiler alert: some of them get hurt, possibly die. Um, when they, I, I guess I would say, unintentionally alert these dogs of their presence. So there's a dog hiding in the warehouse, and as they go to get the thing they're looking for, which um, the um, episode doesn't reveal to you until well at the end of what it is they were after, what they were trying to find in the warehouse. And if I recall correctly, maybe you guys can help me with this. I think when the the man climbs a staircase to remove a box, there's a, a robot dog kind of sitting idle, and he alerts it by grabbing the box, I believe. Um, and the dog kind of wakes up. Um, we were talking earlier, like the dogs mimic the boston dynamics dogs that are I, I think youtube famous i think they are um from what the employees who created them do to them and you know they try to film goofy things with them even though they're they're created for a, a, a i guess a good uh technological um reason so then when they find the find this box the box falls um it does break open we don't see what's inside it yet until the very end and then it becomes almost like a creepy chase scene where the robot dog begins to hunt them, um, catches up with one of them, and really the, the, the woman character is the character that's left 
and then she goes on this kind of quest to, I guess you'd say trick or elude this robot dog so she can survive. Um, comes upon a house where these robot dogs have already kind of uh, taken care of the owners. Um, spoiler alert, I guess. Um, and then she goes through searching the house, if I remember. And um, th there's not a lot of dialogue in the episode. I would say the episode is probably, what, 90% silent besides the sounds of what you hear going on. Um, and there, there comes to a climax where she's... Um, um, I, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not, so if you haven't seen it, you probably should turn away, where she's trapped by this dog um, and then fights back. Um, I know in the in the episode, the scariest part of the episode, at least for me, was how these dogs track the humans. Um, they have these exploding, I don't even know what you'd call them, these exploding trackers or markers that they shoot up and they explode and stick into your skin. And at one point, I think the woman attempts to remove one of them because she gets yes, hit by one. With a knife of some with sort. With a knife, um, just so she can't be tracked. And she tries to outsmart these dogs as she's trying to elude them. Um, I think the most of the dialogue and the most powerful dialogue was towards the end when she realizes she's kind of trapped and she can't get away because she's been hit by these markers. Um, and she talks to whoever's out there. And I think she even might even say the name of her, I guess you'd say her husband and her and her kid. They're, they're trying to find something for the child. And the assumption is through most of the episode that they're looking for, you know, medicine or something like that. Um, the end of the episode, um, after she kind of, we, we go away from her and she's kind of, would you say doomed? I guess the right word is doomed. Um, we see that um, what exactly was in the boxes that they were searching for. And I'm not going to uh, reveal that because I think that's the biggest part of it. And it's, um, it, I guess, Andy, the right word is rocks you. <laughs> it completely rocks you at the end when you see what it was they were actually after um, and the significance of that. Um, uh, you start to think about, you know, should they have been after that thing? Was it worth three possible lives to go after the thing that they went after? So I guess that's the synopsis in a box of what. Yeah. And uh, there's so much there. I think just yeah. <laughs> you've just kind of tiptoed around a lot of the elements. But Heather, maybe you'd let me bring you into the conversation. Sorry. What are some of the kind of themes that you think that this episode, um, you know, basically these dogs have artificial intelligence build out to an amazing extreme. And the fact that they're flexible to, they're, they're killing machines, similar to say the Terminator uh, movies. Uh, so this is a dog instead of a person. But, um, you know, just talk about some of the themes that relate to society today that I think the episode is hitting on. Sure. Um, we're in a time period where artificial intelligence is just exploding. Mm -hmm. the, the Boston Dynamic uh, robots that were um, discussed earlier, that actually started as a program at MIT, I think, a really long time ago, but it developed. And if, if you've seen the YouTube videos, the things that the dogs are capable of, it's pretty amazing. So I've thought for a few years as artificial intelligence has increased in robotics and things like that, like, what if technology like this was put into the wrong hands. And if you have a killing machine that can self-repair, that is, um, that can be solar powered so that it can constantly <laughs> recharge. Right. Um, and has a tracking device like the chips that you put in um, children or um, pets where you can find them through GPS. I mean, it's it's very frightening because there are some countries that do things that they shouldn't. And it wouldn't surprise me if there are researchers looking into something like this right now. Because think of what they do with drones that are operated by a computer somewhere else in the world. And the accuracy at which they do things um, is, is amazing. And I kept thinking as I was watching the dogs is... Have they somehow become self-aware? Was that the story? Or is there some one or some group of people, maybe from another country or whatever, that were actually operating them like a video game as if 
you know, because they're not really there. That takes away the human con connection. But they are um, controlling the movement, the location, how, I don't know, because you could see kind of like this infrared appearance showing up that they were, vi the, the robots were visualizing. So through temperature, they, they could find where the person was. I don't know. It just, it blew my mind because a lot of the technology that those dogs were capable of using <laughs> are technologies that exist today. I mean, think yeah. about it. Yeah. Something similar could already <laughs> exist. And I, I know that's a very dystopic look into the future, but I think that's um, that's a frightening way to look at what the potential of artificial intelligence and robotics and being able to control what the robots do more and more and more is rather frightening. Can so, you know one of the things in this episode that hit me, and I'm a, a, a fully admit it, I'm a dog lover. And so, you know, to have a dog, you know, again, it's robotic. It doesn't look so much like a dog, but it looks enough like a dog where you're like, no, not not dogs. Like, not, don't make dogs evil, please. You know, maybe um, a cat would have fit in a little bit better. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, you just, uh, you know, again, and I think that's one of the disturbing pieces of this is that, you know, the dog was was the predator in this particular case. So maybe talk both of you about those connections of what we know, you know, living connections versus robotic connections. Any thoughts there? The, the, the thing that I think is troubling when you watch it is that the dog, who's I believe to be one of the more emotional pets that you have, you can see, look at your dog if you have a dog. I'm not a dog guy, but I have a cat. But even my cat, I can look at my cat and look at its face and see the different moods it's in. You can tell when your dog's happy or angry or something's wrong with it. And these robotic dogs had no emotion at all that these people were not trying to hunt it or hurt it. They were just trying to get something for a, what turns out to be a sick child. And they had no emotion at all. Um, and and I think, and Andy, you had mentioned this before, I think that there's no human connection between the human and the dog. And I don't know of more of a more human connection between an animal and a, and, a, and a human being than a dog and a person. So that that struck me like how emotionless these dogs were, that they were just killing, basically killing machines and didn't care what was happening. They just are going to hunt humans and kill them. Heather, do yeah. you want to add to that? Sure. Um, as we move further into the whole robotics of human life, I think that they're going to continue to create robots that mm -hmm. can assist you around the house and things. Some of them already exist. And I don't know if you're aware of that, particularly in Japan, people <laughs> date bots. Um, artificial <laughs> intelligence... <laughs> Yikes. It's so good that it can fool, you know, a huge percentage of people. So purposely, they know that this online uh, person that they're FaceTiming is not really a person. And but that, it, 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 anyways, there's another Black Mirror episode that we can sort of discuss at another time that this reminds me of a lot. But they have an online spouse and they talk with them. They share their deepest. There's like online psychologists that you can talk to. And people know that it's not real, but they still develop this somewhat relationship and become attached to them. <laughs> but on the other side, what we're talking about with here, I mean, I am a dog person and I don't know what I would do without my dogs that... Um, unconditional love and the contact that they always want to be near me. And, um, you know, on, even though they're black labs, they still think that they're lap dogs and want to be on my <laughs> lap all the time. And how much I love them and how much it feels as though they love me. And I think they do. Um, and then they used purposely a robot that looks like a dog. I do think that that was intentional. But also I think it was intentional that those dogs look eerily like the dogs that have already been made through that MIT program. I mean, if you watch those videos, I mean, they're kind of like the same sort of setup. Yeah. And um, 
that scared me too, because I, I don't know that the um, writer had the intention of doing that. I'm thinking he probably did because it even shows more how reality is that something like this could happen. And, um, I don't know. I think there's two pieces to it. That lack of human connection is, is huge. I mean, as educators, we are told that the most important thing that you can do is to make a connection with a child beyond anything you could teach them content wise. That's the most important thing. So we're already, I don't know about the two of you, but I, I think you'll agree that technology for kids is taking away from human connection. You see them on devices right when they're in a group, they're not looking at each other. I see teenagers looking at adults um, and not looking into their eyes anymore, almost kind of looking down. That's really sad. And um, we've opened up this can of worms. And I don't know that there's any bringing that back in the negative consequences of that. We have even seen fully yet so i i know i'm talking very dystopic here and um but i i do battle even though i'm a technology integrator i feel like i have the good and bad on my shoulders telling me look at this great thing that technology can do for kids and i'm like look at the terrible things that technology <laughs> can do for kids yeah. do you ever feel that? yeah like all that the time, moral yeah. Yeah, uh, did you guys? It's interesting. Did you guys know that the creators of these robots, and I, I didn't know this until after I watched the episode and I started reading some stuff. The creators of these robots are kind of a little bit famous for the um, videos they've made with these these robots, where the well, the, the Boston Dynamics dogs that where the dogs fight back. They're they're doing things to these dogs, like you know, get me a pizza and all this other stuff. And they're, they're, you know, pushing the dogs and doing all this stuff. And the dogs become smart and begin to fight back against them, push them down in that. So they're, they're spoof videos and they're kind of like uh, CGI videos, but they look really real. You should take a look at them afterwards. And, and people thought that this episode of Metalhead was a response to those videos. Like, okay, what if the dogs fought back all the way? What would it right. Be? I don't Interesting. Think- so that becoming yeah. self-aware? Yeah, he's self-aware, aware. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Heather, you you started kind of hitting on the impacts of education with this one, and again, as a, as a as a parent and a teacher, I always kind of come back to those when I watch a Black Mirror episode. Um, other other elements of education that this kind of brought to your mind, like how does this? What are some thoughts about the dangers of technology, especially when it comes to education, or just rethinking? you know, our use of technology, we're all lovers of technology and we want to see technology use, use awesome, you know, for great purposes. But um, other thoughts about education and technology based off of this episode? I only really had one that struck me as I watched it was um, how powerless they felt against the dogs. And in my working with technology in schools and talking with parents and that, how powerless they feel keeping their kids, I don't want to say away from it, but limiting the use of it. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, just, I, the, thing that popped, the, the thing that popped in my head as I watched it was how powerless the people were against these dogs and how powerless parents feel. And even when parents take phones and things away from their kids for overuse or for whatever, that the kids then give up their own, I guess, login information to their friends to keep their streaks and all these other things alive on the apps. And the parents kind of throw their hands up in the air like, okay, even when I take the technology away from my kid, when my kid leaves, they could still be on it somewhere else or having someone else do it for them. So the, I guess the, the I, when I watch it, the people look like they were powerless against this. And even though you get some hope, there's a little bit of hope in it when she kind of tricks the machine. But you feel almost powerless uh, that you're, you know, hopelessly connected to it. And kids are too because they're growing up with it and there's just no way to you know, break it. I don't even know if that's the right phrase, mm-hmm. but that's what I got from it. So, yeah. Well, I th- as, yeah, go ahead. Uh, as you were saying that powerless term, you know, there's a lot going on in neuroscience where they do brain scans of adults, children now. And you've probably heard that they liken people's um, 
attachment to their devices as an addiction. And when they look at the neural pathways that are associated, it is the same exact path pathways that is associated with addiction, alcoholism, drug use. So like young children, you've probably seen the story of them having an iPad and the parents getting frustrated and taking it away. And the child screams and has a tantrum. And well, it's actual withdrawal that they go through because the chemical makeup of their brain changes. And when a person is online and involved in social media, as the likes on their posts increase, it also increases endorphins in their brains, which is basically your body's narcotic. And then when they don't see those likes or the likes decline, it all starts to break down. So increase in depression and they are attached. You know, um, I don't know. I, I think that that is a, a big concern too. And we are seeing more and more issues with mental health. Uh, remember, you know, when I was a kid, Sure, there was there was bullying that went on and so forth, and but you could go home and you got away from it for a little while. Mm -hmm. They they can't help but turn their hand and look at that phone. It's like their arms are automatically, you know. And um, I've heard from some high school teachers at the high school that I work with where they'll have this um, something hanging on their door with little pouches for them to put their phones in, and the kids are just constantly still like grabbing for their phone and things. It really is a physical and mental uh -huh. addiction. Well, uh, one of the things that struck me, and I've, I don't know if you guys have done any online teaching or online learning for that matter. In fact, I think most of us have at least taken an online course or something like that. And I think one of the things that this brought home to me was the idea that, you know, and, and I, as an online teacher, it's really difficult. You really have to go an extra few steps to try and make a connection with that person on the other end. If you're never meeting them, don't meet them face to face. So again, technology, we can do so much with online learning, but in the end, there's still that human connection. And I think we as adults, we don't need it as much. Um, because we can focus on content pieces. But I think to me, and I think one of the big points with the big reveal at the end of the show is the human connection, especially for children. And I think, you know, I love online learning. I love technology. But for 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 children, we still need that face-to-face -face is probably the most, you know, powerful thing we can do for kids. And really, if we don't expose kids to technology until their fifth grade, I'm okay. I'm kind of okay with that. I mean, I know Me we have to scaffold it in and, and slowly develop it. But, you know, I, I do hear that a lot from teachers, and I'm sure you do, do like, oh, these technology is ruining everything. And, you know, at the younger grades, I do really feel we, and, and again, what this episode to me as a teacher said, as a parent as well, is so important for kids, especially young children. And we, we've got to really be sensitive to that. And, you know, I know with VR technologies, they're saying it's not recommended for kids under 11 or something like that. And I really think, you know what? Yeah, that's that's okay. I think we need to be really cautious about VR and yeah. fully immersing, immersing kids because I think we need to really be cognizant of that. And to me, the ending was so powerful in this episode. And for those of you who haven't watched it, Please watch that and, you know, stay with it till the end. It's dark, it's thing, yeah. but that that human connection just blows you away, what they're actually looking for and how powerful that is. If we create a society that's all technologically advanced, as much as I love a lot of those possibilities, that, that human connection, I think, is, is a huge piece. So maybe we'll finish it on that. What are you guys' thoughts on just that and the okay. ending? Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge piece of it. I mean, they always say the single most important factor in learning is the teacher in the classroom. So the more you can make a connection with a child for social and emotional health and every type of development, that's the most important thing that you can do. And I really think we've pushed it a little too far and we need to rein it back in and use technology when it is going to increase and deepen learning. Um, and I do see a lot of places where you, you could actually have technology help the teacher to make the connection because if kids are working on things, you can walk around, sit down with a specific child, talk to them face-to-face -face while the class is 
working on a digital type of assignment. So if we can channel this in a way that increases the amount of one-to-one contact that you have with a child, wouldn't that be amazing? Great. So we just have to, we have to rope it in, you know, and, and I love your idea of not introducing the technology <laughs> until they get to middle school. I think that's huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They don't, uh, I, I do notice even with my daughter who's 16, you know, they can be in the same room with each other and don't converse with each other because they're looking at their phones. And I, I would say to my daughter when she has friends over, you know, why didn't you invite them over? You could have done this with them at their, at their house. There's no reason for them to be here. So I, I would agree with all, everything that both of you said about the human connection part, for sure. Well, and maybe to end on a, a little bit of a positive note, again, I'm, I have a young kid who's going into third grade and he uses technology and he uses it a lot. Um, and to maybe end on a positive note, he watches YouTube, this video series called Simple History. And I'm telling you, this kid learns, he learns, he knows more about history of the world than I do. And again, he enjoys it. Again, we, we monitor what he's watching and how he's watching. And this is a pretty nice view of, you know, history can get pretty dark itself. Um, but he learns a lot and they do a nice job of not showing violence. It's cartoon based videos, but Right. They're they're good. So give that a look. Even as an adult, you'll you'll like these videos. They're What's the name, interesting. What's the name again? Uh, simple history. Simple Just history. go on YouTube and do type in simple history, and there's a whole Thank you. bunch of videos. Definitely check but, it out. Going yeah. to be teaching history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Oh, it's it's awesome. Yeah, link it with uh, Ed Puzzle and Beauty. I think I think you could get a lot of learning out of it because he's like I said, he's in third grade. And he knows a lot about world history. So Fabulous. that will end on a positive note. So thanks Great. everybody again. I, I to me when I I looked at um, if yeah, I think you Wikipedia will rank like like other how other people put this as far as like top ten lists or something, and Metalhead is kind of gets middle of the road uh, treatment. But to me, I'll be honest with you, this one was the most powerful episode for me. And again, the ending blew me away and had me thinking for weeks. And I still think about that ending like, gosh, you know, and maybe it's because I was one of those kids that carried a, well, I won't, I won't say, <laughs> that, that loved toys, I know what you're that loved about. my favorite toys, you know, my action, we'll, we'll say action figures. I had action figures that I loved. I mean, they were like everything oh, yeah. to me as a kid. So I guess I related to, to that. So I probably gave up too much on that one, but. Nah. No, but <laughs> when you find that thing for your child, get multiple. <laughs> I learned that after my first child. <laughs> my, I stop. my daughter still got her thing. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it, it's it's seen better days. <laughs> a lot of better days. Yeah, uh, it's got a name. It might as well be a part of the family. It's still there. Exactly. So, yeah. The attachment that we have to things as kids oh, is absolutely. powerful, powerful. So, all right. Well, thanks, guys, for taking time out of your summer vacation. And uh, we'll, we'll see you hopefully in person soon. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> right. great. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Enjoy your summer.